This is from uh, Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of God comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit upon His glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before Him. And He will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least ones, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome, naked and you gave me no clothing, ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is a reading from the Gospel of Luke. There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and from the netherworld where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, 
whereas you are in torment. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. Many years ago when I was traveling downstate New York, uh, after I left teaching in Notre Dame, I uh, heard on the radio, I was driving a car, and I heard on the radio a uh, commentator that I hadn't heard since being in South Bend. He's not played in Boston, I guess. He's a new show, a fellow by the name of Paul Harvey. And uh, I heard his introduction to uh, a particular show. And I said after I heard it, I said, my goodness, I wish I had copied that down. And, um, I don't know, maybe a half hour later after I was uh, driving along a little bit, fooling and fooling with the radio dials, I, uh, there was again the same show, syndicated show, I guess, radio show. So I, geez, I pulled over the side of the road. And this is what he said. This is how the show began. He said, Absence of cannon fodder in the United States. Absence of cannon fodder in the United States. American mothers are not bearing enough babies to keep up with the Asian hordes. Therefore, it is essential we have an increase in our nuclear arsenal. And he went on to explain that you fight wars with people or with technology. And if you don't have the people, if the American mothers aren't going to pull their load in this, then we need the technology. Now hold that for a second. At the close of his last political campaign, in a speech that he gave, <clears throat> Dwight Eisenhower said, I don't care what God you believe in, just so long as you believe in God. I don't care what God you believe in, just so long as you believe in God. Now we know that all politicians like to have God on their side. But this is absurd. I don't care what kind of God you believe in, just so long as you believe in God. It's absurd because <clears throat> the human being is fundamentally composed, all human beings, with a religious consciousness. Makes no difference when or where they're born or live, there is a religious consciousness. The history of humanity is also a history of religion. And that religious consciousness that, that's, that's, that makes the human being, any place, anywhere, anytime, is fundamentally at its root based in a question. All human religious consciousness starts with a question regardless of where or when it exists. And that question is, the question indeed that all religion responds to, that question is, that is the root, if you will, the stuff out of which religious consciousness comes, that question is, what kind of God is God if God exists? And what does God expect, if anything? 
The history of religion is the history of asking the question, what kind of God is God if God exists? And what does God expect? To say God is, is to say nothing. It satisfies no one under any circumstances. It does not satisfy the human heart, and it does not satisfy the human mind. For God is, is an empty statement. The human heart wants to know what kind, wants to know what kind of God God is. The technical presentation of that, the human heart longs to know the nature of God. And by knowing the nature of God, one then knows what God expects. And so the history of religion is a history of answering that question in various ways. Huh? Some say God is this, some say God is that, some say God is evil, some say God turns the universe on and lets it go. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on. Huh? So also is what God expects. Some say God expects cult, some say God expects... Uh, 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 um, you know, having the right kind of kind of verbs to praise him with. Some say God expects fertility stuff. Some, you know, God God expects human sacrifice. Goes on and on. What God expects. Now let's go back to Paul Harvey. At the end of that show, that very show. At the end of that show, the very last thing that he talked about was he exhorted his audience to pray to to write to their congressmen asking for and supporting a school prayer amendment remember what he had just said previous to that absence of cannon fodder in the United States American mothers can't bear enough babies to keep up with the Asian hordes therefore an increase of new glass is necessary Now what I'm saying here, and the reason I'm raising this is, when Paul Harvey asks for a school prayer amendment, he's asking for school prayer amendment so people can pray fundamentally to a God that he thinks supports a nuclear arsenal. There is no such God in existence. That's a figment of his imagination. That's idolatry as much as the totem pole that people bow down in front of. I say that because I believe in Jesus Christ. That he who sees me sees the Father and there's no way that Jesus Christ is going to be supporting a nuclear arsenal. Paul Harvey's dealing in idolatry. Now I don't want my children going to school praying to some idol. And I don't want my children going to school thinking that they're praying to who the person is praying to next to them when the person wants a nuclear arsenal. There is an understanding of the kind of God that God is and what God expects in the New Testament and that's revealed by Jesus and that is the true understanding. Anything that conflicts with that is wrong. That is the ultimate revelation of the nature of God is in the New Testament, is in the person of Jesus. And it's the ultimate revelation of what God expects of people. Everything is secondary to it. And therefore, any dialogue with any other religions of the world huh, is not a statement that everything that they say is wrong. It is that anything that they say is right has to be in conformity with what Jesus teaches. It's that simple. Why? Because Jesus is not Gandhi. Jesus is not uh, 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 Buddha. Jesus is not that little speck over there. Jesus is the incarnation of God. I remember one time being at a Trappist monastery, and uh, one of the monks was, uh, was, was deep into Zen Buddhism and meditation techniques and all kinds of other stuff, you know. And... Uh, uh, I was there and I was, there was something to do with nonviolence and so forth and so on. But as we were talking just privately, you know, with a couple of other people, uh, he, said, uh, he said something like this. He said, you know, he said, 
He said, uh, why are you so insistent on saying that, 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 that Jesus is the way? He said, you know, that, that Jesus is a holy man. You know? He communicates a way to salvation. He communicates a way to live. But he said there are other holy men, and then he went on to the men and women and talk about Gandhi and then Buddha and so forth and so on. And then he said, it's like this. This is what he said. It's like you got the sun up there. And down here you got the lake. And every once in a while you see a little sparkle on the lake. Really bright sparkle. And that's, that sparkle is like, you know, one of the holy men and women that come along in history. And it's there for a while and then it leaves. And then over here there's another sparkle at a different time. And that's another holy person. So this is Gandhi, this is Buddha, this is Jesus. And indeed, he, the monk, believes Jesus is the greatest of the sparkles. The greatest among them. And he is a way, but Buddha is a way, and Gandhi is a way, etc., etc. Huh? So why are you saying Jesus is, 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 is the way? So my fresh answer to him was, I'm saying Jesus is the way because Jesus says, I am the way. <laughs> he doesn't say, I'm a way. He says, I'm the way. And there's no question that's what it means. And then I said, the difference between what you're saying and what Christian belief is and has been from the opening is, there's no question you have all these sparkles here. And there's no question that Jesus is the greatest of the sparkles. But the difference between what you're saying and what Christianity is saying is that Jesus is also the sun. It's the source of the sparkles. Now what I'm raising this for is this. We live in basically somewheres between an agnostic and a synchronistic society where people don't know whether God exists or doesn't exist, whether God expects anything or anything, so forth and so on, and a world in which everything is just thrown together and God somehow becomes a blob of bliss someplace. That doesn't work. Because the way we're made is we want to know the kind of God and we want to know what God expects. And depending on what the nature of God is, God's expectations are different. Now, if God is a God that made one person that he loves and loves infinitely and made everyone else to be junk for that person to fool around with and destroy, eventually, that's one kind of God. If, however, God is what Jesus says he is, Abba, Father of all, through all, in all, huh? That's another kind of God. If God is just a God that want, loves one group, and every other group in the world is meant to be subservient and, and, and is inferior and so forth to that group, then that's a God that endo endorses racism. However, if God is Abba, that's another God. And different things are expected, huh? From the one kind of God, it's only meant that I serve this person or this group. From the other kind of God is I serve everybody. If God is just a God that turns the world on, kind of a deus ex machina thing, and lets it run, and has no expectations of anybody, then it makes no difference whether one is Hitler or St. Francis. The fundamental principle then is, what makes me happy? It makes a difference to the human soul and the human spirit than what the nature of God is. What kind of God is God and what does God expect of anything from people? That's the question that all religion tries to answer. We as Christians say our answer to that question is in Jesus Christ no ifs, ands, or buts. This is the entire answer. Jesus is the ultimate definitive revelation of God and God's will to humanity. 
The one who sees Jesus sees the Father because Jesus and the Father are one. And there's no doubt of what's being said. Now, this raises an enormous question in terms of what we're talking about. When we look at Jesus, Jesus, Jesus says, huh? unlike the amorphous kind of thing of God as a blob of bliss where we just kind of figure it out what's going on, Jesus says what God expects. For example, he says, I expect mercy, not sacrifice. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. No place does Jesus more seriously communicate what God expects in language that the simplest soul can understand than the two passages we read before we began today. Matthew 25, the last judgment passage, and Luke 16, the rich man dies and Lazarus. There is no question Matthew 25 is authentic Jesus' teaching according to scripture scholars. It is not necessarily the very words of Jesus, although that may be. But there is no question that that is his teaching that has been preserved. And Matthew 25 is the standard for judgment at the end of time. It is the standard of judgment at the end of time because it is understood is the standard by which we should live moment to moment to moment. It tells us very explicitly what God expects here and now. Said another way, it tells us why God created us. In short, huh, it says what God expects is mercy. Mercy. I was hungry, you gave me wheat, thirsty, you gave me, etc., etc., we can keep adding to those. I was unloved and you loved me. I was etc. etc. Huh? God expects mercy. On the negative side, we can sum up what it says in one sentence. On the negative side, it says, apathy. Indifference to human pain. Indifference to human suffering. Apathy. Apathy in the face of relievable human misery is radical evil. That's what it says. Apathy, indifference to human suffering. Apathy, in the face of relievable human misery, is radical evil. You can't get more radical in terms of evil than to say it results in eternal punishment. This particular passage was so, was so noxious to one of the great minds of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, that he simply turned to Buddhism on the basis that the compassionate Buddha uh, he liked better than Jesus. Because it is very, very clear what Jesus is saying and it can't be cut out. There's no way to take it out on the basis that for some reason this is an ancillary teaching that he really didn't teach. The notion of hell which is what we're talking about here, has its place in this way. It often gets confused because what we do is we take, if you will, human metaphors related to it and we make those the reality, not staying with the fact that whatever hell is, it's beyond human experience and time. It cannot ultimately be presented in human language no more than heaven can we can only present it in analogous language, metaphorical language. But the notion of hell in human consciousness does exist, independent of the form. I mean, some people may think in an anthropomorphic form, you know, hell is pitchfork and flames and devil and, and, and that sort of thing. Other people might think in a psychological form, huh? Hell is like being trapped in an eternal nightmare that you can't get out of. Other people might think in a metaphysical form. 
Hell is like the, 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 the utter dissolution of being, the utter, the utter end of being for a person. The form is, not, is, is only form in terms of our language, huh? but the reality in back of it spiritually is this. It is possible in time to do things that result in eternal negativity. That's what's being said. It is possible in time to do things that result in eternal negativity. The form of the negativity is only metaphor. But the truth that Jesus is talking about is this. Indifference to human pain, apathy, when it's possible to respond to it, does something to the person that can have eternal consequences negatively. It's kind of like if we use our little story of the lady of the little, of little faith from this morning. That is, a life of tiny deeds of Christic love and mercy produces an immersion in the divine slowly but surely, like one step into a lake after another. And eventually, as one is immersed in the reality, one begins to know something about the reality. However, using our, that story, the other way would be equally true. If one refuses mercy, one refuses the reality of God. One refuses to enter into it. One refuses to participate in it. One can't know it. Not because God doesn't want it known, because I, I choose not to step in the water. I choose to go on and get a second PhD in water instead of stepping in. This is, this is a tremendous issue. There is something in the human psyche that tells us, even if we can't articulate the details and the nature of it, that life is no joke. That human choice is important and it does make a difference. And that freedom, while admitting it's limited by time and space and everything else, that whatever freedom a person has, how they use it, is not irrelevant to the individual or to history or to God. Because in the end, it is freedom that separates us from the animal. Pavlov's dog salivates with just the ringing of the bell after a while, huh? Hunger or not. That's it. But once you take freedom away from people, you take the ability to love away. Love is either a choice or it doesn't exist. Or as Father McKenzie says, the only kind of love that's available to the Christian is free love. Anything that interferes with the integrity of human freedom interferes with the ability to love. If I hold a gun at your head and say, I say, say, say you say you love me, and you say, oh, geez, I love you. <laughs> That's not love. You're mouthing the words. It's just fear. Huh? But it's only love that saves, and love requires freedom. Therefore, when we look at the notion of hell, we are looking at something that is inside the person deeply inside the person that understands that his or her freedom and freedom of choice really is important even if they don't know why and the details of why. That it really does, that this is not just our hour upon the stage in which we fret and then that's the end of us. There's something important about the way we choose there is something about us that senses, and this is Abraham Heschel's, the Rabbi Heschel's words again, there is something about us that senses that something is expected of us. For what reason we don't know, but there is a sense that something is expected of us. But to have, an ex to have that sense requires that one has, a, has to simultaneously have a sense that there is someone expecting God. Now, what kind of God is God if God exists? And what does God expect of us, if any, 
that we're back to the question, huh? Now look, it is your prerogative as it is my prerogative as a human being to accept or to reject the understanding of what God expects as is given by Jesus Christ. Now if one, as it is your prerogative and it's my prerogative as a human being, to accept or reject Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. But here's the problem. Since we are talking about Jesus as the incarnation of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Word of God, the Savior of the world, the ultimate revelation of God, the one thing that we can't do is we cannot accept the person and reject the teachings. This is, this is an impossibility, humanly speaking. Why? First, there is no person available to any other person in the world except as that person is known by his or her words and deeds. That's the only way we know other people is by what they manifest to us in words and deeds. So, for example, if you were to go out of here after this weekend, and you were to say, geez, I went to this weekend with this uh, father, Charlie McCarthy, and so forth, and, and uh, gee, that guy really, uh, I mean, he's really supportive of, of, of uh, tripling the nuclear armaments in the society. <laughs> now, you would be using my name for whatever reason, but you wouldn't be talking about me. The Charlie McCarthy you would be talking about would be a figment of your imagination. Why you would be using it for persuasive purposes or whatever, who knows, but it would be no one that actually exists objectively in reality. So also would we separate Jesus from his teachings. We can use Jesus to justify all kinds of things, huh? Every one of the seven capital sins has been a few more have been justified in the name of Jesus. But there is no such Jesus in existence. The only Jesus we know is the Jesus of words and deeds that we have in Scripture. And it makes no difference if you have revelations to the extent of Teresa of Avila. If those revelations aren't in conformity with, with what is said in the Gospel, they are zero. If an angel of light appears right here and says something is God's will, independent of the, that's different from the gospel, the word is anathema that Paul uses. It can't be. Right? Now, so it is your prerogative or my prerogative to accept or reject Jesus and his teachings. As it is your prerogative and my prerogative to, to, to reject them. But we can't have it both ways. We can't accept the person and selectively choose some of his teachings. It doesn't fit. It can't happen because you're talking about God. God is not selectively right or wrong like Einstein or Clinton or whatever, you know. God is God. In the Catholic Church, we celebrate the Eucharist. And one liturgical function that we have is adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Where people go in and, and, and the consecrated host is, is, uh, is in a monstrance and, 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 and people genuflect, uh, usually on both knees or bow, and then there's adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. All right. The formal teaching in the Catholic Church is that that consecrated host is do latria, L-A-T-R-I-A, latria, the Latin word for that worship which is to be given to God alone. The consecrated host is do latria, that worship that is to be given to God alone. But that worship could not be given to the consecrated host in which the body and blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ reside if Jesus Christ wasn't God, objectively speaking. 
Otherwise, it would be a figment of one's imagination. Now, it becomes important here in thinking about this to work with this business that God says, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, the judgment is on the basis of apathy or mercy. Indifference to suffering or suffering, or, or, or relief of suffering at all different kinds of levels. Huh? There is absolutely no question about that. And the passage reads, if you listen carefully, when the Son of Man comes to judge all the nations of the world, not just Christians. And you could reasonably ask, why is it that this passage says Jesus comes to judge all the nations of the world on this standard which he preaches, but most of the people who ever lived never heard of Jesus. How can they be judged on something they never heard? And yet that's clearly what the passage says. When the Son of Man comes to judge all the nations of the world. How can, how can people be held to a standard that they've never heard? About 50 years ago, a woman died who was a great philosopher and ma a mathematician by the name of Simone Weil. She became a Christian in her own way. She was a Jewish woman who became a Christian in her own way. I say her own way because she... Uh, she felt she had to remain unbaptized. Although her belief was, was, uh, was, was pretty formally in conformity with, uh, with the church about Jesus and so forth. Anyway, as the first premise of her philosophy, Simon Weil has this. Human beings are not fundamentally born into rights human beings are fundamentally born into obligations the first of which is to respond to human suffering this is the first premise that is this is what is self-evident this is the beginning of a philosophy that doesn't have to be proved you can see it just by being human why because when I am in pain I want to be relieved Therefore, I know that when any other human being is in pain, he or she wants to be relieved. Therefore, when I live in a world where I am immediately and totally surrounded by human beings in pain, I know that I am here to respond to that and to help. Nothing needs to be proved. It is self-evident. It comes with being human and the, and the capacity of empathy. That is how the Son of Man can come to judge all nations on the standard, standards of indifference to human pain or not. Perhaps, just perhaps, without anticipating and knowing God, but perhaps there is a way in which Christians have a higher responsibility because they've explicitly heard what God expects. But let me read this to you. This is from Time Magazine. And it's just, uh, it's just one paragraph. And it reads like this. It says, The loudest noise on campuses this year is the grind for grades. Corporate recruiters are drawing record crowds of students and bringing good tidings. Student demonstrations today are rare. And when they do erupt, the protest is not against some big political issue, but such things as local tuition increases. Eric Mowowie of Haverford says, We are definitely apathetic. But it is a beneficial apathy. It is an apathy of satisfaction. We have been through enough for a while. We need a break. Now we can go forth and party without feeling a sense of remorse. Now, however, if it's a, uh, a Christian college, it's a Quaker college. And I'm sure Time Magazine isn't picking on Harvard. 
I'm sure that what it's saying is this is the general mood. But listen to the words. We are definitely apathetic. I mean, this guy, what Jesus calls radical evil, this kid's proud of. I mean, this is no closet apathy here, you know. But it is a beneficial apathy. It's an apathy of satisfaction. Can you imagine? In a world that's a furnace of pain, one person dying every nine seconds and stuff, and on and on and on, huh? In a world where in seven years, one third, one third of the adult black population in this country will be unemployable, ever. Just because basic skills, reading, writing, that sort of... It's a benef beneficial to whom? Satisfying to whom is this apathy? We have been through enough for a while. Now, if you want, to have it, it's a good school. But this is stupidity. Someone who thinks four years of college education in America is a tough life? We need a break. Now we can go forth and party without having a sense of remorse. What Jesus calls radical evil no longer even produces remorse. It has often been wondered, because it is a fact, that Adolf Eichmann, who appears to be the person that was primarily in charge of all the concentration camps and the, and the extermination, the Holocaust, huh? When Eichmann was captured, and when Eichmann was brought to Jerusalem, one of the most astounding things that was ever found was he was normal. He was absolutely, positively normal, rational, sane, he simply had not one ounce of remorse for what he did. It didn't exist in him. And we wonder how. But how does it differ in terms of anyone at any place, at any time that could have helped someone who was suffering and didn't? Normality and sanity in the world in which we live includes being apathetic. Being able to ignore pain and misery for whatever reasons. <coughs> now, the reason this is important is not because Plato said apathy is a terrible reality. That mercilessness is a terrible reality. Not because Aristotle said it or anyone else said it it's because Jesus said something is happening to you when one is, uses one's life and one is indifferent to human pain. And that happening, whatever it is, takes place in time but affects eternity. Now Jesus could be wrong about what the standard of the last judgment is, huh? Uh, but then how can God be wrong about the standard of the last judgment? To say that is to say he's not God on such a serious matter. And he does not say that missing Mass on Sunday or anything else we can imagine is going to ultimately be definitive at the last judgment. He says indifference to human pain, mercy and apathy are the issue. Now look. How did Eric Maui, this young lad that we just talked about here, how did he get that way? He didn't make himself that way. He, was near, he didn't start out that way. He could just as well have been a person committed with compassion and mercy to using his life up for caring for people. But that's not the way it was, huh? The only way Eric Maui could have gotten that way is that the two generations in front of him had nurtured him. They were in control of the nurturing system. Whether it be family, school, television, or whatever it is, it was the adult world in front of them that nurtured the consciousness into apathy is justified, into apathy is normal. Remember what apathy is. Apathy is mercilessness. That's what it really means. Now, What has actually taken... You'll see how all this fits in a second. 
into the nonviolence. What has actually taken place in the Christian churches, at least in the first world, that's our world, and probably beyond the first world too, is that they have developed an ethics of justified apathy. What God says is radical evil. What Jesus' understanding of the last judgment is, in the first world churches and perhaps in all the churches, there is developed an ethic to justify what Jesus says is radical evil. Now no pastor, no priest, no bishop is going to get up there and say you can be apathetic. That's not the way it's done. No one's going to get up there and say even from a pulpit, you can be indifferent to human pain and misery. No. The ethics of justified apathy is taught in the church by the pastors and by the people to themselves as it masquerades as the, just, as the justified pursuit of the good life for me and mine. I have a right to the good life as it's defined before I have an obligation to respond to human misery. For example, we'll take an extreme example to start with. Several years ago, there was a woman who was involved in a major divorce in the United States. Big money involved, okay? Big, big money involved. But once you go into divorce court, you got to start releasing figures because they got to make, you know, it becomes public. And it was found out that this lady, this woman, the previous year, had spent $10,000 on just underwear. $10,000 on underwear she spent. Now we can say, you know, what kind, what had happened to the personality? What has gone wrong that, that, that this craving for underwear? <laughs> Something's wrong, huh? And in the world in which we live, one every dying, one person dying every nine seconds of starvation, one person every six seconds because they can't get the medicine for inoculant disease and so forth. What, what is going on here? with all the human misery and need to respond to $10,000 in underwear? It's be literally, who needs $10,000 in underwear? But what, what took place is, uh, the way I define it is, that, uh, that something that was absolutely non-necessary had become a vital to her. So $10,000 in underwear was a non-necessary vital. Somehow this artificial need was created in her and got a hold of it and she had to have it. And it made no difference if someone was right on her doorstep dying, which they were. I mean, $10,000 can keep people alive for years. A lot of people. But which of us and who of us can wave a finger at her? Because which of us and who of us has taken the last judgment passage so seriously as to say no to the artificial need system. I will redirect what I have to something else. In real human life, there are three things through which we work and we have control over. Our mind, our time, and our money. Mind, time, and money, huh? This is where, this is how we live. As we choose, huh? one of the great questions in life is what to do with time. There's a limited amount of it. We've got all kinds of options. How do we direct it? Same thing with our mind. Huh? How do we use it? And with our money. Mind, time, and money. Now what anyone knows is this. Mind, time, and money that is used in one direction can never be used in another direction. If I take a dollar and I spend it here, that's a dollar I don't have to spend over there. If I spend 10 minutes here, that's 10 minutes that I don't have to spend over there. Huh? If I use up my mind thinking of something for 25 minutes here, that's 25 minutes that can never be used up on anything else. That is, once I choose 
everything else has stopped. It is now this that I have given myself to. Hmm? Therefore, any serious endeavor in life, whatever it is, is always the intentional directing of mind, time, and money in a, in, in a particular way. You can tell how serious people are about a commitment by how much of their mind, time, and money they direct at it. For example, you want to build a Trident submarine? You don't do it with bake sales. You don't do it with bake sales. You do it by a tremendous commitment of human time, human mind, and money. All laser-like focused because you want to accomplish the end. Well, this presents the problem, huh? We all know that mind, time, and money that's used for my luxury is mind, time, and money that cannot be used to serve other people's necessities. It can't be. There really is, in those mind, time, and money categories, there is the choice for mercy or for apathy. It is not just the woman with the $10,000 in underwear. It's all of us. And Jesus knew that. And it's not just the rich, it's the poor. It's not just blacks, it's whites, it's, it's everybody. For we all have to make the choice in terms of mind, time, and money and where it's going to go. We have a perfectly good set of clothes. I mean, perfectly good set of clothes. They're warm. You know, they're not ragged. They serve their purpose. And the hucksters from, from, from New York and Madison Avenue come in and they say, you know, the lapel is this, uh, it's a half inch and the dress goes up a half inch, out goes them off. And if we keep them more than six months beyond what they do, we're just embarrassed to be in the street with them. A sweater comes out and has a, a, a whoop-de-doo sign or something on it. Never thought of it before in your life. Six months later, you wouldn't be caught dead without it. But every choice for that direction is simultaneously a choice where something is not going. That's the point. For example... I haven't looked at the figures now in, in, in a long time, I'd say seven or eight years. So these are seven figures from seven or eight years ago. I'm sure these are, these are minimal compared to what they were seven or eight years ago. But seven or eight years ago, I looked at the figures. Do you know how much money was spent in the United States on horse, dog, and harness racing in one year? Eighty-eight billion dollars. Not million, billion on horse, dog, and harness racing to watch animals run around a circle. Eighty-eight billion dollars. You know, in a few weeks it will be income tax day, right? Eh? And outside the IRS office there will be all these people picketing, you know? And you have all, all, all liberal people and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll want a 10% uh, tax cut in the military budget, you know? And then uh, to, to go to human services, see? They want to redirect my time and money is what they're saying. And then you have the radical people they want a 20% reduction in military budget, you know? And then you have the real kooks, they want a 30% reduction in military budget. And they're all out there with their pickets and so forth, or whatever the case may be. Do you realize that none of that's necessary? All you got to do is get the Christians out of the dog track, you got your money. <laughs> <laughs> When was the last time you heard a, a, a pastor, a preacher, a priest, a minister get up in the pulpit and say, folks, this congregation is dressed far too well. It's spending too much money on booze. There's too much luxury in the parish. Friends, Jesus Christ taught that the greatest impediment to the kingdom of God is wealth. And that's a fact. The greatest impediment to, the, to attaining the kingdom of God in the New Testament is wealth. Now, friends,
friends. We're in this together. We got to stop redirecting mind, time, and money because really, being in style at the rate we're being in style is just merciless. It doesn't happen. I mean, I've heard confession all these years and so people come, I've yet to hear someone can bust me father or I've been apathetic. <laughs> but this is the standard for the judgment at the end of time. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying there aren't other sins, huh? What I'm saying is, we have wound up in a situation what, with what Jesus overwhelmingly emphasized as the great issue in human life that touches eternity, mercy and indifference to misery, or mercy and mercilessness, has become a non-issue. We freely, loosely, and everything else just spend mind, time, and money. Think of the mind that is spent just meandering through worthless magazines and on and on and on in front of television. And the time that is spent. But you see, I'm not saying there's anything... If, look, if you get your kicks out of watching dogs run around in circles, if this is the high point in your life, you know, fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And that is intrinsically evil with it. But what I am saying is, in a world where one person dies every nine seconds of starvation, etc., etc., this is a low priority. And it always has to be measured against the other. The direction of the mind, time, and money. All right. This fits into Jesus' teachings nonviolent love of friend and enemy. Because when I have more than I need and the other person does not have enough to live, the only way that I can retain my excess, my luxury, in the face of this person's absolute need is with the gun. There is no other way to do it. There is no appeal to reason or faith that can be made to justify my maintenance of excess when other people don't just don't even have enough to live. There are fellow Christians, and because this, most of this group is Catholic, I'll say it, there are fellow Catholics. In many parts of this world, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, huh? And their choice is which child do they have to left, leave die. Triage is a part of their family life. There are fellow Christians in this world that do not bond with children in love until the child is up around three or four years old and they're sure the child can survive physically. Remember yesterday I talked about the Constantinian Revolution and all that happened there and how he redirected things? Now, now think about this. Spiritually, what happened at the time of Constantine was this. Before Constantine, the church was a non-temple religion, as I said. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there, Jesus is there. Tokyo or Berlin, it doesn't make any difference. They did have places to worship, but they worshiped in the ground, etc., etc. Okay. And therefore, the temple wasn't necessary. But once the temple came into existence, something else happened. Spiritual, psychological, and very, very real. Another reason Christianity was a non-temple religion was because it was understood that there really was a temple of God on earth. That there really was a place where God resided on earth like God resided nowhere else on earth. And it was understood that that temple was the person. The human being had the spark of the divine and therefore the human being should be revered 
because in that person dwelt God, dwelt the Spirit of the Holy. Therefore, is homicide, killing people, was not just a sin. It was not just homicide. The reason that people were excommunicated in every church in Christianity for homicide before 265 AD is, Rome being the first church not to excommunicate them, but after seven years of, 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 uh, of uh, public penance, they allowed them back in. I mean permanent excommunication. The reason that excommunication followed homicide is that the person was the temple of the holy God dwelt in the person and therefore every act of homicide was fundamentally an act of sacrilege. It was desecration of the temple of the holy on earth. Every act of homicide was an act of desecration in other words. Now when was the last time in the newspapers or in your church that you heard homicide referred to as desecration of the temple of God. If I went out to the church here next door, you know, and I went in there, and I tipped over the pews and knocked over the altar and pulled the stations off the wall and knocked the cross down and everything, you know, the next morning would be in the papers, you know, priest desecrates church. Or the same thing would be if I went down the local temple or that priest desecrates temple. But literally, that dimension of the Christian life no longer exists in any kind of operational form in the Christian psyche. The notion that you desecrate a human being when you attack and kill them and so forth. The notion on the positive side that the human being deserves reverence, period. Not because you give them reverence, not because they're good Joes, And this is the reason the human being deserves reverence. Because God dwells there and that person from the womb to eternity belongs above all else to God. The person belongs to God and God dwells in the person and that's why reverence is given to the person. And that's why homicide was experienced as desecration. Now, step back. Matthew 25 says something strange. It says, the last judgment passage, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty. And they say, where? And the answer is, whatever you did to the least, you do to me. Well, if I'm hungry, hmm, it's me that's hungry. Now, if you help me and you give me something to eat or something to drink, if I'm thirsty, you're helping me. I'm not Jesus. What's he talking about? He says, you're doing it to him, meaning Jesus, but you're helping me. How? First, if God dwells in the person, and remember, this passage is to all nations, not just to Christians. If God dwells in the person, then there is some fundamental way that when I respond to that person, I have to be responding to the divine. Because that's where God is, and God loves that person. Said another way, huh? It's this. Isn't it strange what happened to St. Paul on the road to Damascus? Wherever the event was, however, it, you know, the light and so forth, huh? The question is, Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? Paul has never seen Jesus, as far as we know. The question is not, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute my community? Why do you persecute my people? The question is, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul's never seen him in his life. 
And it's very, very clear. It's M-E. It's nothing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts or what's what's done on the road. And he says, Who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you're persecuting. How? He's never seen Jesus. He's just killing people, torturing people, so forth and so on. When we hurt someone, we simultaneously hurt all those who love them. All of them. We never just hurt one person. Regardless of the form of hurt, when we hurt, we hurt every single person that loves that person. Christ God loves that person. When we hurt someone, we literally hurt God. Since the time of the since the time the church became involved in Greek philosophy, and I'm using the word differently here. The notion of God that has basically come through the community is that God is an apathetic God, meaning in this case apathetic, that God is a God devoid of being touched by feeling. That is not the New Testament understanding. That is not the Hebrew understanding. God is affected by human feeling. Why should God just be affected by ideas? Beyond that, when God becomes human, he is like us in Jesus. And therefore, since God loves us as a human being, because he is now human in Jesus, he is affected. Saul never kills Jesus. He doesn't even know Jesus. But he tortures and maims and so forth those who are loved by Jesus. And if you have a child and the child has diphtheria, you may not be suffering diphtheria, but you are suffering all, at least something as bad as diphtheria. Or if you watch a child die of hunger that you love and so forth and so on, you're not dying of hunger or whatever the case may be, but you're, you're watching the misery and the pain and you suffer. We never just attack a person. It is always everyone that that person loves that's being hurt. And that includes God. Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Whatever you do to the least, you do to me. But the other side is equally true. And that's the mystery of it, the grandeur of it. When we serve a person, we respond to the pain of God. Whatever you do to the least, you do to me. If you can persecute God, one can serve God. If one can be indifference to God's pain, because God loves the person that we're being indifferent to, one can be attentive to God's pain by being attentive to the person. I'm not making it up. Jesus says it himself. Why do you persecute me? He says it himself, whatever you do or don't to the least, you do to me. He says it himself, the one who says, I love God and does not love the neighbor is a liar. It can't be in love, huh? That's not the way love works. Love hurts when the person hurts. When someone you love is hurt, you hurt. Jesus' model for God the word that he uses to try to communicate to us what the dynamic of God and what God expects from human beings is, huh? and what the nature of God is, is Father, Abba. Now, if you were a mother or you were a father and you had two children, for one of the children, life goes kind of well, you know? It goes on. You know, the guy he has pretty good intelligence, he gets the brakes, uh, you know, he just, things kind of work for him, you know, and they, people kind of like him naturally. He's kind of, you know, that kind of guy. Everything goes well and he gets a nice job, you know, and, and he's very grateful to you and he genuinely loves you. 
And he comes to you and he's always saying, Mom, Dad, geez, I love you. Thank you. And, you know, let's go out to eat. And, uh, you know, he's, he's getting you, you know, takes you to Hawaii for a vacation. And he does nice things, you know, because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And then you get the other son, let's say. Things don't go well for him, you know. Everything always, the breaks just don't come. They seem to, it, everything goes wrong, you know. He meets the wrong people. He, the job doesn't work out right. He gets the boy. Everything goes wrong for him, it seems. And, uh, and he's kind of one of those tramps in the street we heard in the song, you know. Do you love him any less? Of course not. He's still the one you love, huh? Every bit as much as the other one. He still you remember the child on the knee, the child bouncing around. You know, like the song says, some mother's darling, some mother's son. Once he was fair and once he was young. You remember all that, huh? The agony is terrible because he's no longer fair, he's no longer young. In fact, he's being battered around by other people all over the place and ignored. And yet he was loved and is loved. Now this other son that's doing well, think about it. This other son that's doing well never bothers with the other brother. Just lets him languish in his misery. The one that you love is out there hurting and this one that loves you does nothing. But he is forever coming to you with gifts and, you know, saying I love you and so forth. Wouldn't you much prefer by a hundred million light years that this one here take care of that one rather than come to you? Isn't that the real nature of love? You would prefer that this one would never say I love you again, not because they don't love you, but would put the mind, time, and money in over here. Because to reach out and touch this agony is indeed to, to try to assuage your own agony. And all the I love you's from one direction when he's doing well will never, not that they're not appreciated and not that but they will never touch this. But if you really love the parent, you would go here. Because in stopping this pain, this pain is stopped. And every parent knows that. And that is Jesus' model for God and humanity. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? But in order to do that, mind, time, and money has to be redirected another way. In that child who's hurting, the parent lives. Lives. To respond to that child who's hurting is to respond to the parent instantly and automatically and organically. Whether it be by apathy, mercilessness, or mercy. That child can be torn apart as a tramp in the street. And if someone comes along and tears them apart one inch more, it hurts all the further, the parent. There is no end to it. And if someone comes along and relieves just a bit, it helps the parent. It is this dynamic of mercy that Jesus comes to proclaim. And, in some mysterious way that we don't understand, the technical word, is, word is, in Greek is mystical. Mystical just means hidden. In some hidden way that we ultimately do not understand, and far deeper than just us in the, in the lives of our loved ones, God is there. God is there. Now, at ground zero in all of this is simply the choice of what to do with mind, time, and money. Whether we are going to accept Jesus' understanding of the nature of God, Abba, 
and what God expects of us or whether we're going to accept someone else's understanding. But I always give this lecture, even at the cost of a lot of things, when I go around and talk, and it's one of the reasons that I seldom ever give one night things, huh? because I can't, don't have the time to get to this point. This is essential for the understanding of nonviolence. There is no nonviolence without understanding what I just said down. Nonviolence is not fundamentally about not doing something. It's fundamentally about doing something. Loving as Christ loved, which is unbound mercy towards the deserving and towards the undeserving, because all are loved by God. And if I love God, I love those who God loves. And in some mysterious way, I assuage the pain of God. I stop persecuting him. So that when the Council of Bonn, which I mentioned last evening, wrote, to spill the blood of a Christian in war is to spill the blood of Christ. They knew what they were talking about. Because Jesus is there in the least. And when one soldier stands over the other with a dagger or a bayonet at the other's throat about to plunge it in, and this one is in terror on the ground, or when someone comes over and drops napalm and, and it simply splashes napalm and all the agony of napalm and burning that slow burning to death that it causes, when that happens, something happens in God. Why do you persecute me? Whatever you do to the least, you do to me. The one who says he loves me and does not love the brother or sister is a liar. It can't happen that way. And yet the other side is equally true. The other side is equally true. The mercy given the effort at mercy. The higher the effort, the more things happen. Huh? There is no end to the possibility of mercy because there's no end to the possibility of suffering that's out there in our time. There is no end to responding to God and to relieving the pain of God by relieving the pain of those that He loves, relieving the pain of Christ by relieving the pain of those Christ loves because what's out there to relieve is just inexhaustible at this moment in time. Other things happen way beyond that that we can't imagine once we start the process. So when Mother Teresa, who by the way no one talks about, Mother Teresa is absolute on her rejection of abortion, war, capital punishment, right down the line. No one wants to talk about it. She'll say it to anyone, anytime, any place, anywhere, no war, no abortion, no, no one says anything about that. But Mother Teresa, huh? Remember in the little thing by Malcolm Muggeridge that the, the leper there says, uh, <coughs> the leper says, uh, was picked up off the streets and so forth and so on, huh? Uh, he says, I have lived like an animal, but I'm dying like an angel. That's exactly the way he should die that's exactly the way God wants him to die and that's great peace to God and to be left on the street is something else to God so when Mother Teresa was asked how many lepers do you pick up? 20? 30? look at Calcutta tens of thousands of them all over the place what difference does it make? what, what can you possibly do? What, you know, what kind of life is this? That there's no program, there's no anything. It's just one person after another helping and on and on. What can this possibly amount to in this world? And going back to our discussion of means and ends this morning, her answer was, fidelity is my business, success is God's business. As simple as that. 
Because when we respond the way Christ God wants us to respond, something else, the invisible side, works in an utterly different way. Utterly different way. Things happen that we can't imagine. Because the power of God is being released through us, which is the power of mercy. And when we don't respond that way, other things happen. But there is no way to talk about nonviolence unless this is talked about explicitly. Because when I have more than I need and someone else does not have enough and I refuse to be merciful with the excess, and I choose to be apathetic, I keep the, I keep the excess only by the gun. Jesus teaches evangelical poverty. That is clear. Because evangelical poverty is necessary for evangelical nonviolence. Evangelical poverty doesn't mean destitution. Dorothy Day lived a life of evangelical poverty in the Bowery for 43 years. She died at 82. She had to eat something. <laughs> no, it means living at the level of necessity. It means the directing of mind, time, and money that is beyond what is needed into the care of the brother and sister who's loved by God, into the love of God, in other words. Now, <clears throat> let me conclude with this. In the 20th century, when we say nonviolence, there is one person over and above all others we think of. And that's Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi gave his whole life to this experiment to see what would happen in life if someone took this with total seriousness. Gandhi, by the way, Gandhi, by the way, over and over and over again attributes his conversion to nonviolence to one book, The Kingdom of God is Within You by Leo Tolstoy. And the kingdom of God is within you is Tolstoy's great treatise on Jesus. Gandhi attributes the nonviolence to Jesus. The mysterious workings from the life of Jesus going out. Huh? We, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that, uh, that those people that talk about outside the church, there's no salvation. Well, that's always, of course. But the thing is, who's outside the church? <coughs> who's outside the church? And Mr. Gandhi said, if being a disciple of Christ means living, as, uh, living with my whole heart, the Sermon on the Mount, I am a disciple of Christ. But no one let him join just for that. <laughs> but Gandhi, it, Gandhi owes his nonviolence before the kingdom of God is within you. Gandhi was just a $240,000 a year lawyer in South Africa. Big, big money. And after the kingdom of God is within you, he walked away from it. But that's Jesus coming through history, huh? In the mysterious way that things work on the invisible side from Calvary to us today. Now, his whole life then is given to the nonviolence. Everything is the nonviolence. What, what is it? What it's all about? How does it work? The failures, the experiments, everything else is the nonviolence. He is the apostle of nonviolence in the 20th century. And so shortly before he was shot, in 1948, Nehru said to him, You know you're Hindu. You know we're going to burn your body when you die. But you know too, there's going to be a national monument someplace. Now, if there's going to be a na national monument, you are the apostle of nonviolence. Why don't you write your epitaph on it instead of someone else writing something about you? You know what you want to say about nonviolence. What you write is what we'll put on there. What do you want to leave to the world is the essence of your whole life and the nonviolence, everything you've ever done. You write it, I'll make sure it's on there. So, of course, Gandhi was assassinated in January of 1948, died, body was burnt, and the monument went up. He did write what he wanted on there. And this is it. This is what the Apostle of Nonviolence, the man who gave his whole life to in the 20th century, 
This is what he sees as the essence of the issue. It's on his monument in India. He says one sentence. Recall the face of the poorest and the most helpless person you have ever seen and ask yourself if the next step you contemplate is going to be of any use to that person. That's Matthew 25, in other words. That's Dives and Lazarus, in other words. Recall the face of the most, recall the face of the poorest and most helpless person you have ever seen and ask yourself if the next step you contemplate is going to be of any use to that person. It is an extraordinary statement because as you remember in Matthew 25, the question is, where did we see you? Where did we see you? It takes perceptual courage just to see the suffering that's around us. But if we do not have that courage to at least let it enter into us, nothing will ever be done. We've got that courage to let it into us, to see it. Because we know that when that one suffers, our God suffers. Persecute me. What you did to the least, you do to me. Anyone that says they love me and doesn't love the brother or sister is not telling the truth. Recall the face of the poorest the most helpless person you have ever seen and ask yourself if the next step you contemplate is going to be of any use to that person. Abbe Pierre, who was the founder of the Emmaus House Movement, huh? and they are, they're all over the world in different places and they work with not only feeding and take care of street people, taking care of street people or homeless and refugees, but actually building community with them. There's a, there's a wonderful Emmaus house in, uh, in Harlem, New York for 26 years and spectacular job. Huh? People learning how to live together and uh, it's Christian kind. Abbe Pierre's motto was the Christian takes care of the least off first. There are people to take care of the middle class. There are plenty of people to take care of the rich. The Christian takes care of the least off first. And as Mother Teresa says, I give to the poor for nothing what only the rich can afford. I give to the poor for nothing what only the rich can afford. There really is something of critical importance between redirecting the mind, time, and money of the individual and the Christian to mercy and out of this terrible world of merciless apathy. Just think about it. All the powerful people, the men and women in the world, the ones that are quote unquote public servants, any place they go, the higher the public service, the greater number of the bodyguards that have to be around. <laughs> Because everyone knows we're not talking public service. We're talking about prestige and prerogative, power. Mother Teresa walks the world, no problem at all, any place in the world, because everyone knows she serves. She serves. Mercy is the protection of God because mercy is the life of God so why don't we stop there and take a nice break now um, we're at uh, 
Okay, we're at 3.30, so we take, uh, let's see, why don't we take about a 20-minute break, 20, 25, let's say 25 minutes, and then we'll be back, okay? And then